Uh, the topic that I'm going to be speaking about today is osteodensification, immediate placement with a one day restoration. Mauricio? There we go. Thank you. There we go. So, um, I am a general dentist in Brooklyn, and I think one of the great things about being a general dentist is that you get to do the entire case. Um, if you can handle those cases, it's a wonderful thing because you really get to do the foundation all the way up to the finished restoration, and that's the exciting part of being a general dentist. And uh, we've been working very hard over the past um, year to develop a VERSA-guided surgery protocol using um, a different technique. So I'm going to go over that. Um, I want to thank our CEO of VERSA, uh, Dr. Salah Huwais, who is a true authentic Syrian. I am second generation American, but my family is from Syria, but he always does call me his Syrian little brother. And this is Aleppo. It was a really beautiful city, and as you all know, it's uh, not looking too great these days, but I'm sure we will rebuild, get stronger, and move on to a, a great country once again. But when we moved to America, um, we developed a new family, and it's the Versa family. And I think that uh, any companies that I've always gotten involved with, I like the family style orientation. I also like family Italian style meals. But I think the Versa family is a wonderful family. Over the last two years, uh, since first seeing Versa at the um, ICOI in Florida, we've had many different people come along um, from all over, including Samuel, who came all the way from Moscow. Uh, a lot of different uh, users. We have Howie in Cape Town. You think about the expansion, Zimazor in Israel. Look how far we've got. We've got Jack Krauser, who's about down the block. I mean, it's really an amazing thing, just how big this family has grown and how it continues to grow. So the question is now, what can we accomplish with the Densibars? You've heard a little bit about um, each topic, and uh, we'll go through just a brief summary of some of my experiences, including sinus augmentation, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And Ziv is going to give an absolutely fantastic presentation which, uh, on, on the technique itself. And it's pretty much eliminated 90% of my other sinus techniques. We also have ridge expansion, which is my favorite tool. I've always been uh, a big proponent of uh, ridge expansion. I have a webinar on Dental XP on uh, ridge expansion and, uh, and piezo uh, ridge uh, PARS, piezo assisted ridge, uh, which Jack Krauser has the uh, trademark on that one. So ridge splitting using piezo surgery. Jack, I'm sorry I didn't put the little copyright TM for you on this one. But it's amazing what we can do with the burrs. Instead of using condensers and bone compressing instruments, there's no need anymore. With the Versa burrs, we can get outstanding results uh, using the Versa burrs to help facilitate expansion at high speed, increasing that bone plasticity, which we could never do with condensation, which is a totally different uh, phenomenon. It is not osteodensification. And of course, immediate implants. You've seen a lot of partial extraction therapy on Dental XP, as Maurice was saying earlier. Jorge gave a beautiful uh, presentation on that. And it's become you know, a very acceptable technique. Howie, I'm sure, will show more about that later this afternoon. But using VersaBurst to help condense, excuse me, densify that bone and redistribute minerals and now get great OSTEL readings of 88 on insertion, day of insertion, trying to give immediate one day restorations. And of course, the all on X procedures. This one happens to be a denture case that we wanted to use the locator style abutments for. And using the denser burrs on minimal bone, we had about five millimeters of bone and easily expand. And look how much bone we can get on that buckle plate while using the denser burrs, not destroying the host, preserving the host, enhancing the bone. And lastly, my favorite bread and butter everyday procedure, not extracting the root fully, doing a, a section, placing your den denser burrs to expand, extract the teeth, and then place the implant in a single visit on a molar, saving our patients several amount of time. In a case that used to take a year to do extraction, graft, wait, come back, we can place bone in sound septal bone. 
and great, great Ostel readings and provide solutions where we can restore these teeth in just three months on a molar. And if you're really aggressive, some people are, are loading even the same day on these cases. So we can't control everything. That's something that we all know. We can try and we do our best and sometimes we will fail. It comes with the territory. Nothing is 100% successful. You can ask my wife. We've tried many times to have many more kids. I have four and we're going to keep going, hopefully. <laughs> so sometimes we'll fail. But you'll fail a lot less if you use the proper tools and have the proper education. Through science and technology, we can increase our control. We can get a hold on our techniques. And dentistry is changing extremely fast. Every day, there's a new technology. Every day, we're enhancing our, our, our practices. And cone beam revolution has become the standard of care in my mind and according to most uh, of the standard of care for these types of procedures. And what we can do with the cone beam, taking our scans, pre-planning, looking at the reconstructions. And obviously there are many, many papers, including the ICOI position paper, saying that we should be using this as a standard of care. And isn't this amazing? A patient comes in in three minutes. We take a scan. We draw the nerve canal. We know our distances. We know where we stand. What kind of implant we can place. How long we can place it. Is it going to interfere with the nerve? What's my safety zone? I can choose an implant the same day. Test it out. See what I think. How does it look? Scan through, move it around. This was something that wasn't possible 20 years ago. And now we can do it using this in our office. 20 years ago, we'd send it out to medical CT scans and we couldn't place in this type of a manner. But it's all dependent on bone quality. And Kalmish, may he rest in peace, 1988 class, did his classifications of bone density. And we still follow these rules from today in terms of our traditional loading protocols. Now, how do we determine that? How do we discriminate what I'm dealing with? Am I dealing with D1, D2? What type of bone? And there are simple solutions. We can drill the site, and we can look and examine that site and see what it looks like. We can determine D1 to D4 bone based on the actual osteotomy site to see is there bleeding, here there's no bleeding, here we have some bleeding, here we have a lot more. D4, D5, it's bleeding as soon as I open the flap. So we can do this intraorally and that saves us not a lot of time because we actually have to go in there and do it. But can we do this in advance? And obviously there would be yes, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about this, right? So our traditionally loaning protocol, based on the MISH philosophy in D1 was three months, and D4 to D5 could be as long as six months. That's a long time for a patient to miss a tooth. If I'm a GP, and I'm giving a, an alternative treatment plan to a patient, I can tell them, I can get you your tooth. It'll take you two weeks if I do a, a fixed uh, bridge. If we're going to do an implant, it could take extraction, graft, four months, come back later, put implant, six months, because the bone's still soft. That could be eight to 10 months before they get their implant. That leaves that doubt in that patient's head. Maybe I want this tooth faster. I don't want to go this long in treatment. I don't like coming to the dental office. I want to be in and out. So we need to be able to determine bone quality. And from regular medical CT grade, it's very simple. Medical CT is a standard. There is no um, discrimination between machines. All machines are created equal, and that's a uh, guideline based on the uh, American um, Association of Medical Oral Radiology that they need to be standardized. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If somebody has a dangerous um, a lesion in their, in their jaw, in their mouth, in their head, in their body, we need to have a standard of care where one radiologist can read this you know, 10,000 miles away or the, even in the same area get multiple opinions. So the hounds fields are actually extremely accurate from machine to machine. And it's by using this simple formula from Godfrey, Godfrey um, Hounsfield that 
based off of water, we know that it's a true density based on medical CT. There is no doubt, no question between them. Machine to machine, it's a standard. What about CBCT? That's what we have in our office. They're affordable now. You can buy a used one. You can get a brand new one. We can get them and, and install them, have them installed in a week and start running and, and learning with it. So does cone beam give us that same answer? Are all cone beam units created equal? Unfortunately, they're not. They are not held to any regulation. So there is a discrepancy. If I have a care stream unit, which I do and I love, and I move it over to a VATEC um, uh, 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 software, it's not going to give me the same, same um, uh, answers. I'm not going to get the same units. So we kind of have to stick with our machines and then use a, a um, conversion to stay within that same program to be able to develop our guides. Otherwise, the hounds fields become less relevant. And this, well, according to our own Paolo Torresi, in his article, will say, will say as well. There appears to be some agreement that the gray levels displayed are not representative of Hounsfield's units, as one would expect from a medical CT. So how do we determine the bone quality? Well, we can use our eyes. We can use our digital eyes and look by color coding, digital mapping. And we can see that one scan, if we change the coloration, or we just look at the density between grays and black with our own eyes, we can determine the density fairly easily. So we can see in D1 bone, we can see how much cortical bone is there. Going all the way to D4 and 5, where we get less of that yellow color and more of that red type of color. So if we're going to plan on this same day implant solution, which is what we've been aiming for, we'd all love to be able to give our patient's teeth the same day. Say, I'm going to take out that tooth, give you a new tooth the same day. Or you have an edentulous space, you've had something, I want to give you a tooth that same day. And it's all based off of initial stability. Immediate loading, same day implant. But how do we get there, from where to where? We base it off of two factors. One will be insertion torque. Obviously, we need primary stability. To get good insertion torque will give us that primary stability. And the other will be our ISQ value. And when we use these two in combination, we can determine when to load our implants. So one way to do this is to just use water implants and under drill. And that's a good option, but that's a condensing option. That is not a densification option. It's a condensing option. We can under drill. We can start in the same sequence, use a pilot drill, go to a 2.0 drill. And then based off of our bone density, we can say, well, I have pretty soft bone, so a hard bone, so I'm going to place my implant after I um, uh, stop at a 2.0. It's pretty soft. I'm going to place a, a 4 and a half millimeter implant at the same time. If I have D2 or D3, I may go to a slightly wider drills. And lastly, if I go to that dense cortical bone, I'm going to drill almost to the final drill to be able to get my, my um, good initial stability. But with osteodensification, that paradigm has changed. No longer do we have to go to that wider fixture. No longer do I have to manage, uh, trying to manage more bone. I can keep the bone I have, preserve it, and then place the implant that I want to place based off of osteodensification without destroying the minerals that are in the bone, keeping it. And you've seen from yesterday's scientific research that this is a proven technology. So we've conquered initial insertion torque. What about ISQ? And what is ISQ? We saw Paul Teresi and uh, Paul Rosen uh, speak about this yesterday. And basically, it's the base, uh, like a magnetic tuning fork. It's going to send a signal. You put in a magnetic smart pet. It's going to send a signal down the implant and give us some sort of a number. It's, I know it's in debate. Some people don't feel that it actually is measuring bone implant contact. But it is giving me a measurement that I can use, that I can repeatedly use and see if there's any variations in those numbers. So it has a nonlinear correlation 
between, between um, the micro mobility. And the scale goes from 1 to 100. And hopefully, getting good torque values along with good ISQ readings, I can place that, Im that implant along with a abutment and maybe a temporary crown in that same visit. So the ISQ value, there is no debate. We have over 800 published articles. You can go on the uh, Ostel website to read them. And we can see time and time again how this has been validated and studied and proven. And there is Paolo Teresi on his study. So as a general rule, you saw Armando speak about this a moment ago. Stability from primary stability is going to decline. We are not dealing with pieces of wood. We are dealing with a live human body that has blood vessels and anatomy and, and, and um, all different chemical activity that's been go going on inside the bone. So that initial stability is going to drop because the bone is going to remodel. It's going to become softer during that second to fourth week. But osteointegration, secondary osteointegration is going to start to occur, rise, and take over. So what we need is to be able to get good torque values, not extreme torque values, but good torque values, along with good ISQs, and we can make a predictable solution to a one-day implant. Now, if we're dealing with single teeth, obviously we'll need higher torque and higher ISQ. But if we're sharing the load with some other implants, then we can lower those numbers. We can get slightly lower ISQ values and slightly lower torque. And if we're going cross-arch stabilization, then we can certainly do even easier loading. Because now we can actually share the load across the arch, spanning the arch. So I equate it to uh, getting a bunch of friends to try to carry a refrigerator up a flight of stairs. If I'm going to carry a, flight, uh, a, uh, a heavy GE refrigerator up three flights of stairs in an apartment building in New York, it's going to be very difficult and take me a long time. So I'm going to need to be extremely strong. Someone like The Rock is going to need to carry that thing up there. But if I get a couple of my friends, like my instructors in the front row to help me out, then maybe we can get that up a little faster. But if all of us, if we had 10 people trying to carry that refrigerator up those flights of stairs, we're going to get up there, that, that flight of staircase quite easily and quickly and accomplish it. So here's a, just a typical case, an older case, where we have terminal dentition on the maxilla. We extract them. These are fuse abutments, the temporary uh, uh, PMMA acrylic abutments that can actually break off. It's a nice design. Uh, that, so if there's too much force on them. We get great Ostel readings. Not above 75 everywhere, but we got pretty good um, readings. And we know we're sharing the load in the cross arch. So we can get temps on the same day. And then just four and a half months later, we can load with zirconia abutments. And notice where the margin lines are. Not subgingival. I'll explain more about that later on deliver our final restorations. And in four and a half months, the patient never went without teeth, and they got nice cosmetic restorative solution. So we've conquered initial uh, stability by having our insertion torques high, by having our ISQ and the proper values. And so that's our goal, to getting the one-day implant. So can we do this with DENSA? So our early attempts to do a guided surgery solution, which I have to give great thanks to Emil Verbin for helping us design these guides and using his Verbin stops, which you can still do. This is still a very viable solution to delivering same-day implants with temporary abutments and temporary crowns. And you can see here's a case that we planned. And the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and the premolar, um, you've seen a lot of partial extraction therapy. So of course, that's what we're going to be trying to save that too, so we don't have to worry about that recession. And we look at the cone beam, and we break it up. We can see we have good bone density. We have long area to place an implant. We're not short on bone. We have good width. 
but we could use some help with densification to help get better stability. So here's our partial extraction therapy. You're going to see a lot more of this, I'm sure, later on. You've already seen Jorge give some beautiful demonstration of that. And we extract the root. I did have to go and remove a little bit more, but for time-saving purposes, we're going to skip that. We can place this acrylic type of guide into the um, mouth and start using the verbin drill stops and drill. And notice how it's open on the buckle. We'll talk more about that. It's very important to have this open concept on the buckle to allow more irrigation. We'll deliver our implants through the guide. It's not a truly fully guided solution, but it's a, a more of a template assisted solution. Then from there, we take our ISQ values. Those are pretty good numbers. And we take them from multiple angles, not just one angle. We want to see where our ISQ values are. We can have low on the buckle and high on the mesial, and we want to take the lowest number. Our post-operative, media post-op with some PRF, looking pretty decent, screw retained temporaries. Three months later, we come back, complete the case with zirconia abutments and uh, final crowns. Nine month post-op. So that was our first case. So we decided to do another case, and as you noticed, there were multiple guides for the first case. We had to swap them out. So we, Emil came up with another good solution to try to get all these in one guide. So, hopeless dentition, we're going to extract these three teeth. We're going to place three implants and attempt to load them the same day, assuming our torque is good and our ISQ is high. When we examine the cone beam again, we can look at the density. We can see that we have good length. We're a little short on width, but not terrible. The second location, a little bit wider, a little bit longer. And lastly, we can have nine millimeters. We can even bump the sinus just a little bit autogenously, no bone grafts needed. So I like to keep the teeth, just like we're trying to preserve the bone, I like to keep the teeth and not throw them in the garbage. This is a dentin grinder. We clean off the tooth, sterilize it, put it in this blender grind up the tooth, and now we can use that as an autogenous solution instead of having to go open up a bottle of allograft or some synthetic substance. So this is the guide, that we, the second guide we made, and we have three areas here instead of using two separate guides. I like to soak my implants in some IPRF right before I place them in. We have great torque on the implants. We have great ISQs on all three. But again, I could accept lower values because I have the help of my friends. We deliver screw retained temporary solution. Three months later, hygiene is not so great, but trying to step it up a little bit better. Open tray impression, which I always feel is a must. If you're not doing open trays, you should really consider because there's much less movement of those transfers. We design our zirconia abutments, and if you notice with the zirconia abutments, look where the margin line is and look at the staining. Why do we have to put our margins all the way down here and try to dig out cement? Leave them super ginger. Have the lab stain them. Let them match it to our final crowns. Make cement cleanup easy. We place these in the mouth and you can notice there's our margin. And the beautiful thing about zirconia, the tissue loves it, very tissue friendly. So after six months, the soft tissue maturation has developed back around it. We have great stable bone, six month post-op. I'm sorry I can't show longer, but we've just been developing this within the last year. It was actually last year in January that we decided to go with a, a versagotted solution. So can we do more? Can we increase this and try to get fully guided, maybe do some you know, final zirconia abutments the same day, or final prosthesis? So it's the same day implant, 
a reality? Is it possible for us to get that, that solution with using the verse of verse? A denser verse, excuse me. So the solution to that was to do a combination, to go fully guided. So here's our pre-planning. We'll take a um, scan. I like to scan the impression, but that really doesn't matter if you're scanning the model. But I find direct impression scanning with blue light um, scanners is superior. And I'm not doing intraoral scanning just yet. And we can plan our implant, create a analog model, develop our final abutment. And if you choose to do temporary crown, I still like to do temporary crown, or you can go to final crown. So we place our implant. It's important, again, to take our OSTEL values and from more than one location. And if we get the good numbers and the good torque, we can place our abutment and our restoration. Same day visit. So by sending this out, we take our scan. We have the lab, the um, three, a company like 360 Imaging, do our sham software development, output our STL file, and then we can send this to our local labs if you choose, which is my preference. I don't want to have to use a big lab like Glidewell or something like that. I want to use the guy down the block from me. I've been using him for 13 years. Why do I have to change? I want to use that same guy. He's been there for me all the time. I want to stick with him. So we input that into CAD-CAD software. And from there, we can design. We can even print in our own offices. And we can mail. I don't have a milling unit, but my lab does. And he's only three blocks away. So we can have that unity of the current lab that we've been loving to use and develop and print and, and, and mill our, our temporary of our final solutions. But one missing ingredient. Some of you have probably seen this on the, on the website. We needed to incorporate the Versa in a guided fashion to make it very, very, very simple. So the brilliance of Salah and his team developed a terrific solution to the vertical stop, which you saw Armando showed and Salah showed a little bit very briefly yesterday. So we have this telescopic stop with a sleeve, and it's adjustable. We put one sleeve on. We can adjust it to the length of depth that we would desire depth for implant placement. We can go to the mouth. If you're not using guides and you want to use this as a vertical stop, how easy is this? We start with our pilot drill, always in forward to create our initial osteotomy. And I think it's very important to remember what Salah was talking about in the morning yesterday, about how if you're getting stuck in dense bone, don't remove that bone. Stay inside the osteotomy, drill in forward, stay inside the osteotomy, then reverse back out your implant. Leave that bone inside. Do not throw away bone. Think about how much we pay for bone. And it's not from the patient. And we can expand our site. And watch the magic of Versa, redistributing those minerals all around inside the osteotomy. Four different sleeves to accommodate the burrs which means we can use this for guided surgery. Develop our guide, one millimeter difference between the length, because we do need to have a stop through the guide. Place our guide in the mouth. We can use our C guide, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. And imagine doing a controlled sinus lift. Controlled, completely. Just follow the instructions. Drill through here. Makes me feel like I'm in Disney World and it shows you that you are here, Matt. You know exactly where to go from there. We can increase our 
our length by just adjusting the sleeve, the telescope. And now go past the sinus membrane. And Ziv will speak much more about this, so I don't want to take uh, away time from that. As you see, we just keep increasing, and this is a completely autogenous lift. No added substitutes. Place our final implant, our final abutment, and either temporary or final crown. And it's available and use, useful in CEREC as well. Four different sleeves, different diameters, based upon the region and the site that you're going to be evaluating. So another evolution, or an, in the revolution, of implant dentistry. So we can use our cone beam again in a case like this, where I have a narrow ridge, pre-plan again, our implants. So after I pick both my implants and evaluate it, I'm comfortable on my position, I'm doing this. This is under my control, just like you would do in your office when you're pre-planning. I can then export this file out to a company like 360 Imaging. But let's talk about something. How I used to do this in the past. In the past, I would have had the same type of situation, congenitally missing laterals, and I would have had to graft, use titanium. Difficult to get closure. Always complicated cases using titanium. This is a little bit simpler using an iGen membrane as Maurice showed earlier this morning. And you can see results from that. They were great. We have excellent solutions for that. Good bone development beyond our guides, beyond our um, uh, uh, bone and going into the uh, um, titanium space. We can remove those three months later, get good ISQ readings. Excellent ISQ readings. And develop our final crowns, and this would take us about, you know, it's a still simple solution. We can do this in three months, four months, which is pretty good. But I couldn't deliver crowns the same day. So let's go back to our case, because today we have Denso. So again, this is our case, and you can see we have a narrow ridge. patient just finished ortho. I did my planning, as you saw. I exported that SDL over to 360 Imaging. They then confirm my placement. If there's something wrong and they think they need a little help adjusting, they can help me plan that. And we look at both our views. We can do our sham software development again. And then the beauty is we can print this in our office. Using the newer 3D printers that are absolutely fantastic. A good friend, Scott Gantz, has actually done tolerance testing between milled and on printed on these uh, new Formlabs 2s, and he says that they're the same, if not better, than actually milled guides. And by the way, Scott invented that 20 years ago and published a paper with Jack Rouser about that, right, Jack? <laughs> In Tanzania. The former Congo. <laughs> so let's go to the case. As they used to say, let's go to the videotape. So we're going to have to do some grafting here because I do have that undercut, and I'm not leaving that undercut for a food trap. So we'll raise a flap, and we're going to do a bone um, level. We'll have a tooth supported, but bone level with our sea guide. But let's examine this sea guide a little bit closer. So why do we call it a sea guide? Well, look at the design. C-shaped. And why is it C-shaped? What is the purpose of that?
Obviously, we'd love to facilitate water, because how does den these denser burrs work? They work off of allowing water to get inside the osteotomy. Why do we use haptic feedback? We're bouncing our drills to allow more water into the site so that we can create that vortex. You saw the gel video from yesterday that Salah showed, and that tornado effect that occurs inside the osteotomy, sucking everything in, moving everything out. We need to preserve that. We need to keep that. So having this open technology, not using a port to try to foot uh, to force water in, but having natural water flow through there. But the added benefit, visual inspection of the site. Often when we're using surgical guides and they're completely closed, we start drilling. We have no idea what's going inside there unless we remove it. And if we're using a bone-supported guide, it's extremely difficult to take the thing on and off to check what we're doing. We never want to remove those. From there, we can make an analog model. and develop our, I'll show you in a moment, our final abutments. But again, haptic feedback, letting that water get in there, bouncing the drill. I don't play basketball anymore. As a dentist, we don't like to jam our fingers. So this is as close as it gets to basketball for me. I think Maurice probably still plays with Eddie. Am I right about that? Yep. So instead, I choose skiing and try to kill myself, mountain climbing as well. Figure if I die, at least my wife gets a lot of, of uh, life insurance policy out of it. So we're bouncing the drill, getting our haptic feedback. We'll continue along to the next drill. Bouncing along, getting that feeling, that haptic feedback again, making sure that we're down to the sea guide. Visual inspection, we know that we're there. Water is getting through, redistributing all those minerals, creating that tornado style effect inside there. And then to the final drill. Again, case like this, no fenestration. I'm keeping my two millimeters on my buckle. Easy. Again, C guide down to length. And from there, we have a choice. If we're using the Versa guide at this point, which we're still trying to develop a, a solution to, to deliver through the C guide, which we should have by the end of the first quarter of this year, then which will be a great solution. But for now, we can go with our fully guided placement. We can switch guides. And since we're printing them in our office, this is pretty cheap. We can develop our, our final um, abutments and deliver, that, deliver our implants. We can see. Here's our mock-up. We want screw-retained prosthesis for this. This is during surgery. I don't want cement during surgery. So we develop our final abutments. I'm going to make temp crowns on here with vent hole here, cement them out of the mouth. So we drive it through. And I'm using the R2 guide. If you have a different implant system, you'd use your system and drive it home through. There are universal kits available. So this can be done with any implant system. And we take it down to length on both sides. And you see, because of density, we get these great, great torque values. I try not to exceed 60, 70. I'm comfortable with that. I don't really need to go much higher than that. I'm using a torque wrench, getting myself down here about 60. And you can notice here, it's important. We want to have level with our drivers. So We'll drive it down. Again, there's a marker here to give me level and plus buckle orientation. ISQ. Do I have my values? I got a 75 as the lowest on one of my implants and an 80 as the lowest on the other, which is good news to me because that means we're wrapping this up on the same day. Profiling the implant. We want that emergence profile established from now, not from later. Mike Pico showed you yesterday how to adjust the bone to create that emergence profile. It's important to do this now. You're at the time of surgery to do it. Trying in our temporary crowns. Torque in our abutments. And again, trying our temporary crowns. Again, look at the margin line. 
Keeping ourselves level, proper position. Very important. We can add our bone graft using PRF materials of your choice. And in this case, I'm doing a veneer graft. So I use BioOS because I know it's going to stay there for f pretty much forever. Just like the steak I had last night in my stomach. Again, IPRF um, for the sticky bone, APRF or CGF or whatever your choice of PRF that you like to use. Then have good closure and look how, look how these crowns, they're already, we repositioned, we have nice, good, easy, soft tissue closure, so creep, going apical creep later on is not going to be a concern. And this case was just done a month ago, so I only have about a three-week post-op, and you can see things are healing well. We did do a phrenectomy as well at the same time. So the tissue's gonna look a little gnarly for a while, but look how the tissue's still here. I love this. This is not my final solution, but I can always laser this tissue, reposition it. So we can accomplish this in a one-day one visit. This is at, three, at uh, two and a half weeks, post-op x-ray, bones looking great. And now we'll follow this up long term. Again, this is new. This was developed in, Jan in uh, so the December, this case was just performed only uh, less than a month ago. And we've been working harder and harder to strive to try to deliver this to you by the end of Q1 this year. Here's another case. Maybe we could do a free gingival graft over here, right? So she's a unique person, she's a terrific human being, but will only let me do one arch at a time. <laughs> so the lower, we did conventional, because this is before we had our, our guided solution. And the upper is going to need lateral sinus lifts, because there's no bone whatsoever. And uh, we're going to try to give her a prosthesis that she can walk out with same day, so that she's not without teeth, because that's her pet peeve. She is not wearing a denture. So I didn't make a promise, but I said I'll do my best. So the lower is completed. And now we're ready to start on the uppers. Again, we do our mock-ups, do our pre-planning. We extract all the teeth, and you know how I feel about throwing out teeth. Not a big fan of throwing them out. So, I'm going to do some grinding. We can grind this up, and you can take out 16 teeth. It's, I feel terrible throwing away 16 teeth worth of bone graft. That can equate to about, maybe about 18 to 20 cc's. So we can use this for the sinus lift later on. We can sterilize it and save it. We can put it in our extraction sites that we're going to have here. So we use a bone level guide in sequence style like Dr. Pico showed you yesterday. We can flatten out that ridge with your choice of instrumentation. And then we can pl place our VersaGuide over that, have our telescopic stops, place our multi-unit abutments through the same guide, never taking off the, uh, the foundation guide, deliver our temporary. I'm not thrilled with this temporary because it's a little bit close to the edge here. But again, it's a temporary solution. So I always keep in mind to make two of these prostheses. If they're paying a good fee, I make two so that if it's a short situation like here, we have backup. We can deliver it, and two weeks later, you can see the post-op healing, including with the dentin grinded bone filling all those extraction sites. And here's that one month. And in a few more weeks, once everything's healed up, probably about two months, we'll, uh, in total after the day of surgery, we'll go back and start doing our sinus lifts and finish off this case. For those of you who are CEREC users, I know you're always wondering, can I do this with CEREC? Because they make everything impossible. It's like Apple. You've got to sign 35 agreements, give them your bank account when you agree to the new software update. <clears throat> so Gregory Mark who unfortunately can't be here because he's at the John Coyce facility getting his uh, final uh, certification there. We're very proud of him. He's a big Dental XP family member. And you can see how he's designing his software in the CERAC software. And in addition, if you look here, how he's making the cutouts for the Sea Guide sleeves. Very simple. Not a lot of work. Using the Sea Guide delivers his implants.
immediate post-op on his CT to make sure that he was in good position because he didn't make a huge flap, trying to be conservative. And six weeks post-op, bone levels looking great for him. And he did a sinus lift on this case through the VersaGuide. So this is doable, very doable. And within the next few months, we will have a complete, total, finalized solution for you to get everything that you need to do to have that full uh, guided solution through Versa. So I'll leave you with a few thoughts. Sometimes reverse can be good. <laughs> Backward caps have been in style for decades. And sometimes the wrong hands they end up not so good. I'm not quite sure why he's wearing a backwards cap sunglasses. <laughs> so she's a little bit more interesting. I don't think she figured out which way the bathing suit was supposed to go on. <laughs> Tends to happen. So I'd like to leave you with this as well. Well, I have a couple more. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sometimes we need to go in reverse to move forward. Secret service training. Driving fully in reverse the entire time. I can do that in Brooklyn easy. <laughs> and he's not even using a sea guide. Imagine that. I got to show you the full end because he just does an unbelievable spin in a limousine. That's just so cool. I don't know how the heck he does that. But that's why he's in the Secret Service. So this is a model that I live by. Michael Jordan once said it. Hard work becomes easy when your work becomes your play. What you're doing every day in your office, this should be fun. You should be enjoying this. The revolutions have been occurring in implant dentistry for the last few years. It's getting even more incredible. So enjoy what you do. And remember to stay repeatable and predictable using science and technology as your guide. And if you don't like implants, endo is a great solution. This is a case. No one can tell me they can find more canals than I can. And if you don't like dentistry, I have good news for you. Ellen colonoscopy is on the rise and sorely needed. This is my passion. My wonderful kids, I do this for them. You know, working every day, not leaving to go on vacation to the Ritz Carlton and go to Universal Studios on the Harry Potter ride, but this part, the dentistry part, I do, we all do this for them. We do it for something in our lives, and these are my passion, my wonderful family. And lastly, none of this would be possible without the Versa team. The Versa team is absolutely incredible. Jessica. When Salah is the lead, but Jessica and, and Rob and Fred, and you can see Fred wore a white shirt yesterday, which shocked me. I did not think he would do it. I lost 100 bucks in that bet. Um, and today he's back to black, which we love to see, but he is the, cha the chairman. So I want to thank you for your time. If you want more information on what we do at AIEDental.com. So I thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed the election season this year. It was a lot of interesting fun.